there is a missed opportunity, and that was for the doctor to be considering floaters as a source and cause of this blurriness, because there was one question that needed to be asked. Hi, this is Dr. Johnson. This is another episode in my series of the master class for eye doctors in the management and treatment of clinically significant vitreous opacities, also known as eye floaters. So I want to talk a little bit about why even consider treating eye floaters. I first want to start with a big overview of talking about the heroes of medicine, something like an emergency room doctor, a cardiothoracic surgeon, trauma surgeon, cancer, a general surgeon heroic life-saving actions. This is the stuff that is the, the, the fodder for TV shows and great dramatic stories. But that's a relatively small part of medicine. Most of medicine is improving quality of life, improving range of motion, decreasing pain, increasing the quality of life. And that might be adjusting lab values, monitoring somebody's Blood, sugar, blood sugars and A1Cs, uh, blood pressure, reducing the risk of stroke, you know, trying to lose a little bit of weight. That's what a lot of medicine is, you know, the sniffles, the colds, the coughs, asthma. These don't make for great dramatic stories for TV, but it's a big part of medicine. And in the field of ophthalmology, maybe detecting an ocular melanoma uh, might be saving someone, somebody's life, uh, but for the most part, in the field of eye care, it's mostly improving the quality of vision and, and associated, strongly associated with that, you know, the, the quality of life. That's what we do. Um, but let me give you a hy hypothetical situation. Patient comes in to the doctor and says, my vision is blurry. And the doctor says, okay, um, whatever that means, it might have different meanings to different people, my vision is blurry. The doctor says, well, uh, the cornea looks pretty good, uh, retina looks super healthy, uh, no macular degeneration or anything else like that. The lens has a little bit of yellowing. Patient's 60 years old. Uh, you shine a light in there and you get kind of a funny red reflex, might look a little distorted. And the doctor says, well, let me reach into my bag of offerings. We could do cataract surgery because there's some cataract in there. Vision's 20, 30, but maybe you're, you're getting more distortion and more symptoms. Uh, we'll say with the bright light, maybe it's 20, 40. Let's do cataract surgery. Um, oh, and by the way, we have the old rusty, dusty uh, monofocal lenses, but we also have these premium super duper lenses, 4K high definition vision. Yeah, it's a little extra out of pocket, but this, these are great. You know, these are your eyes after all. So all goes well. They have the cataract surgery. Uh, patient comes back. Pressure's fine. They get them on the eye drops for three or four weeks or so. And after about a month, patient comes back and says, mm, vision's still blurry. And the doctor's thinking, vision's 2020-ish. Um, take a look in there. A little bit of distortion of the capsule. Maybe there's a little wrinkle of the capsule. Doctor says, you know, maybe it's the capsule. Let's, uh, let's do a capsulotomy. Got the wheel the yag laser over. 20, 30 shots of the laser. Pop open that posterior capsule. Let a little time of recovery. Patient comes back and says, nope, vision is still blurry. At this point, the doctor probably says, well, give it time. You need time to heal. Your brain to adjust to the new lens and all that. And walks out the door into the hallway and just goes, some patients cannot be uh, pleased. There is a failure here, a failure to communicate, as the quote goes. And uh, it may very well be that this idea of blurriness, it does have different, different definitions. And there is no um, great language that patients have or, or that the doctors have with the, with the patients to sort of describe the, the, the variances and differences of what blurriness means to, to, to different people. There is a missed opportunity, and that was for the doctor to be considering floaters as a source and cause of this blurriness because there was one question that needed to be asked. The patient says, my vision is blurry. The exam is kind of unremarkable. Uh, the lens really wasn't that cloudy, really. Um, the doctor was just looking for an explanation. All the doctor had to ask is one question, which is this blurriness or this visual phenomenon that you're trying to describe for me, does it move? Is it dynamic? Does it shift? 
if you move your head from side to side or move your eyes left to right, uh, does this blurriness move around? Well, yes, it does, doctor. Yeah, this cloud will move across here. It's really, really blurry. Then it moves out of the way. That's it. One simple question. Does it move? Does it shift? That defined the problem as in the vitreous. I know this patient. I've had a few of them. I've done some forensic conversations with them, and my conclusion and our kind of collective con uh, agreed conclusion was they probably had unnecessary cataract surgery. You know, was it tragic? Was it devastating? I don't know. If they didn't need it, now they paid $4,000 extra for a premium IOL, a multifocal IOL, that has now introduced n more uh, aberrations, dysphotopsias, uh, glare halos. Um, and, and many people are not happy with these multifocal lenses, despite the promises. Uh, maybe we've made things worse. So now they have the multifocal problems, and they still have the floaters. This all betrays a lack of consideration of floaters being a primary problem unto themselves. Listen to your patients. You know, they will tell you that these things create an immense uh, uh, detractor to the quality of life. It diminishes their vision. Now, they might still read 20-20 on the chart. Great. But you and I know that Snellen chart visual acuity is not the end all when it comes to describing the quality of vision. You know, there is high contrast optotype standardized letters against a white background. That's the Snell and visual acuity. That's what we usually say, you know, 2020, 2040, 2060. But there's also uh, contrast sensitivity. There is uh, a color vision. There is uh, balance between the two eyes. You know, you could have monocular double vision with ghosting. You could have two eyes that don't quite align. You know, that's, that's uncomfortable. Each eye might still read 2020, but it's not clear, comfortable vision. So we have all these different qu uh, qualitative qualities of vision that are not measured very well when it comes to eye floaters. For instance, um, Dr. Sabag in Huntington Beach uh, did a study and found that a PVD alone, not the floaters, not a floater, but just having that post, uh, that vitreous cortex membrane peel away and be suspended and redundant and mobile a bit in the mid part of the vitreous. That membrane alone, which may not even be all that visible to us on examination, because our optics blow right past that and, and have nice visualization of the retina, uh, that PVD alone can decrease contrast sensitivity by about 50% on average. Do we ever have any patients that come in and say, my contrast sensitivity is diminished? The typical patient is just going to say, my vision is blurry, it's not as bright, it's not as clear, and it's our job to you know, go through that differential diagnosis. And in that differential diagnosis, it's imperative that we consider floaters or PVD or something like that as a possible uh, a contributor or primary problem that the patient is describing. So we have to try to interpret those symptoms and ask the right questions. One of those right questions is, does it move, as I said before. Herein lies the challenge, though. You might be sold and say, I get it, Dr. Johnson. You're dead on. Uh, I, I do have patients, and I do listen to them, and they do complain. I've never seen float, uh, floaters treated. You know, I, I didn't learn it in my residency training decades ago. Uh, we don't see it talked about much in the journals. It's not, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's a thing. I've heard of it, but I don't really know much about it. This is the challenge. There is no teaching, training, course of instruction, wet lab, uh, a place to go, mentorship to learn how to do this. And that's true with me as well. Now, Dr. Karakoff, now retired, from, who was a uh, practice in Falls Church, Virginia, he did write a book. This is a PDF printout, but it was actually a self-published, you know, real book with real pages and in ink um, on the laser treatment of floaters. And um, that's where I got my start. It was very, very helpful to understand, you know, the physics and some of the considerations, and it was a start. You know, it had some primitive drawings and, and illustrations, and, and the book has some flaws, but, you know, I have to give Dr. Karakoff credit for that. He's the first one that kind of codified this as a thing, so I appreciate that. And then uh, about 10 years ago, LX, now known as Lumibird, when they came out with their Ultra Q Reflex model, they did have a 10 or 12 page book of, you know, little pearls and considerations um, of, of how to treat, or, you know, things to consider when treating floaters. 
I disagree with some of these things, you know, vehemently, but that's about it. Some words on a written page and say, you know, you're a doctor, you got your MD certificate, go to it. You know, you have a YAG laser, go to it. So uh, we're very, very limited on our, our experience and our training just, you know, throughout the practice of, of being aware of laser vitreolysis in particular, you know, being an option for that treatment. So uh, I guess what am I saying here? Uh, going back to what I said in my introduction video is, you know, listen to your patients. They are suffering. Okay, so if you're offering cataract surgery, what are you really doing? You're saying there is clouding of the optical media of the eye, which happens to be in the lens, and uh, to fix that, you'll go in surgically, remove that ocular media, the cataract, replace it with a piece of plastic with its replaced diopteric focusing power. Great. <clears throat> what if you have that much clouding or, in many cases, more and more significantly and truly intermittently obstructive, not just a slight blurring to 2040 or worse, but significantly blocking vision intermittently, and that happens to be in the vitreous? The response is, well, let's give it time. Uh, it'll drop out of the way. Your brain will get used to it. All these sort of usual and typical platitudes of reassurance to kick it down the calendar. Um, my entire practice of 18 years now is based on patients whose floaters have not dropped out of the way and didn't get used to it. Uh, please tell me in the comments the mechanism within the eye to recognize a simple Weiss ring, to recognize that as abnormal material, and somehow the eye is going to clear that out. Do these things that really drop out of the way? Well, occasionally I have seen an older patient whose uh, vitreous has completely liquefied, undergone liquefaction, and it does drop out of the way. But that's until they move their head or move their eyes, and this thing drops up and then drops back down and comes up and drops back down. So that's not really that much better. Uh, it's better than having it permanently fixed in position there, but yeah, is it really that much better? No. I guess consider floaters as a primary enough problem to treat. Now, you know, there's nowhere for anybody to learn this. This is problematic, of course. Uh, there's no teaching, training, certification, wet lab, anywhere for people to learn this. So how do you go about this? Well, that's my goal is to share what I've learned over 18 years and make you a little bit more comfortable with even just treating this, this the more simpler, I hate to say simple, more straightforward cases. A simple, small Weiss ring in a good anterior, uh, posterior position, not too far out in the, into the periphery in big pupil, clear lens, clear cornea, that might be the ideal starter. And you might not pursue this much until you happen to have that one particular patient sitting in your chair and you look in there and they're not just noticing the floater, but they're bothered by the floater and they ask you about it. And you're like, well, um, you know, we, can, we can break this down a little bit uh, to where it doesn't have to be perfect, but just a lot, lot better. You don't have that big thing distracting you. That might be a good way to start out there. And you might just stick with that. You might just kind of cherry pick these simpler and more straightforward cases. And if you come across something more complex, which is more of my typical patient, and I get patients from all over the country and all over the world, I get, in fact, just this week, Croatia and Finland, which is a real testimonial to how much these things bother people. But if you want to send the more complicated ones to me, I'd be glad. That's how I made my reputation is treating the hard stuff. Uh, and I don't get to cherry pick my patients. I, I don't get to pre-choose them. I get whatever walks through the door. So I'm kind of used to seeing some difficult things. But uh, I think you know, you, if you can successfully treat that and safely, of course, uh, that'll be a happy patient. And you are adding value to your practice. But more importantly, you're adding value to that particular patient's life. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Remember, coming back full circle, what do we as, do as doctors? We improve the quality of vision and quality of life. Don't ignore floaters as a potential primary visual complaint. That's all I ask. Anyways, I have lots more in mind for these videos. I will be incorporating actual treatment videos and, and lots of hints and tricks and observations and things that will help you if you're just getting started and even if you've been treating floaters for a while, I think you'll still find it helpful. Uh, if you want to be notified when another video drops or is uploaded, you can hit the notifications bell. You can also subscribe. That will also help others find me. And uh, let's make this collaborative. If you have any comments or suggestions uh, or hints or tricks as well, or if you have a question or an idea for a video that might help me come up with some content, uh, be sure and share that in the comments section. Until that time, we meet again and another video drops. Um, have a great day. Thanks for watching.